Thank you. Uh, and welcome to the You Want Game Speaker Series. Uh, what is You Want Game, you might ask? Well, You Want Game has helped many high school student athletes reach their potential in academics and athletics, as well as personal growth through life skills and career development. The program pairs student athletes with former college student athletes and people who work in the industry uh, who have traveled the same path. In addition to that, there are speaker series and seminars where professionals from various backgrounds are brought in to speak to the student athletes and to give them a look at the game behind the game. Go to youwantgame.org for more information on the organization. Today on the You Want Game speaker series, we have Ryan Tillman. Ryan is a mentor to so many children, teens, and young adults he is connected with throughout his professional life. He is a devoted husband to his wife and serves his community as a police officer for law enforcement agency in Southern California. He is also the founder of BBU, Breaking Barriers United. His mission is to repair the bond between law enforcement and the community by promoting transparency and building relationships. Ryan, what's up, man? Thanks for jumping on. What's going on, guys? How you guys doing today? Can you guys hear me? They can hear you, but they're all they're all muted because they're okay, everyone, perfect, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm doing great. Uh, I just want to tell you guys, first and foremost, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to, for so many different reasons. But before we get started, I mean, are we ready to get into it or we, you got anything else to do? So if, you. Any, if anyone has um, questions for you, uh, they can type them in the chat box. And we'll uh, try to get those answered once you're done or at the end of the presentation. So I actually want to start there. And the only reason I want to start there is because it's going to be, it's going to lead to my transition and how we're going to do things today. So what I want to do first, before you, before you guys get to know who I am as a person and what I do and why I do it, I want to ask you guys right now to, if you had one word to describe the way you view police right now, I want you to write that down, send it in right now. Cause I want to know, cause we got to, one of the things I like to do, one of the only ways we're going to be able to repair things is we got to be able to be transparent with each other. So you guys can keep it as hundred as you guys want to get with me. I'm all about being real. I'm all about being honest. But right now, in one word, I want you to type the feelings that you have towards police. Like if I had to tell you, how do you feel about police right now? I want you guys to give me one word that best describes it. Go. Can you see these? And then if you could uh, read some of those whenever you get a chance. Okay, Defender. Yep, Distrust. Yep, I got him. Distrust. Let's go. Un keep them coming. Unsure. unsure. Okay, keep coming. Untrustworthy. Untrustworthy. Trustworthy. Got it. Got it. Let me see. Unsure. 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 Okay. And keep be real, coming. guys. Be, be real. Be real. I want y'all to be honest. If y'all say, I hate y'all, tell me I hate y'all. If y'all say... um. You know, I love y'all. Say I love y'all. If y'all say heroic, whatever, killers. Okay, there we go. I appreciate it. Keep coming. Keep them coming. Because we, well, I need it. I, this is going to lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about today. So once I get a few more, I want to, we'll go ahead and get into the presentation. But I want to know what my audience is looking like. And I want to know how we're feeling right now, because that's what we have to do. So unethical, bias. All right, bet. Perfect. Anybody else? Anybody else got any, any, any other ones that they got to put in? Essential. Okay. Nick said essential. Appreciate you guys. Anybody else before we get done? A couple more All right, keep good. It coming. All right, excellent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and jump into it. Keep them coming. I'll look back down to those in a little bit. Uh, but I wanna go ahead and get into talking about who I am and why I do what I do. Let me fix my computer so I can get this out of my way real quick. All right, cool. So, hey guys, you know, my name is Ryan Tillman. I'm the founder of Breaking Bears, you guys, Breaking Bears United. Some are probably wondering what that is. Breaking Barriers United was founded for the sole purpose of bridging the gap between law enforcement and the community. And so the great thing about this organization is I've been putting in this work for about six to seven years now. You know, I had no aspiration to being a police officer, but once I got into the profession, I saw there was a need for change. I saw that we needed to go out there and do things differently. So I said, why not me? Why can't I be the change? And so I created Breaking Barriers United you know, about six or seven years ago. This was not something that spawned because of the death of George Floyd or the death of Mr. Brooks over the weekend. This is something that's been going on for the last six to seven years. But before you guys wonder and understand why I got to Breaking Barriers United, you guys got to understand who I am. So like I'm talking to all you athletes out there today, I'm a former athlete, former college football player. I played at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. If I got any football players on here today, just know I'll come out there and I'll route you up to this day. I still got it. I still got it in my jeans. But I grew up in Rialto, California. 
uh, went to high school, played quarterback at the high school there, uh, was in, the, uh, in ASB. And I grew up in a great town. Uh, the town that I grew up in, although it was pretty rough around the edges, most of my friends grew up with single parents in their house. Some of my friends grew up, you know, uh, in the foster care system. It was still a great city because it taught me life experience. And I was able to use that life experience in my day-to-day -day job now. So after I did all that, I graduated from high school, went on. I actually ended up walking on to the football team because my team was trash. We went like 0-10 my junior year. And I think my senior year, we won about three or four games. And so we didn't get the looks that we wanted to out of high school. But thank God, that's all I can say. Because, because of God, I was able to go to UNLV and get that opportunity to earn a full scholarship after my first year there. Once I got out of college, I ended up figuring out like, hey, what do I want to do with my life? And so I always wanted to be a businessman. I always wanted to go into to, to, to business for myself. Uh, I realized that my football had to hang the cleats up because football wasn't meant for me at that point in time. So I started on the business track. I started selling insurance. I started working in retail. I started doing all these different things, but I wasn't feeling fulfilled with what I was doing in my day-to-day -day life. So then I got married to my beautiful bride at home. We got married, we got pregnant with our first son. Uh, and once she got pregnant, I realized I needed to do something more with my life. I couldn't just keep doing and chasing this, you know, these entrepreneurship dreams when I didn't have a foundation that I can come back to. And so my dad's friend at the time was like, hey, Ryan, you should become a police officer. And, and let me tell you, when he told me that, I must have looked at him like, yeah, crap on his face. I was like, nah, bro, I'm not about to be the popo. I ain't about to be a pig. I ain't about to be working for the man, like, not your boy. I'm too good for that. So after a while, I was like, okay, cool. You know what? You know, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, selling insurance. And then after a while, my boo at home was looking at me like, hey, bro, I'm going to need you to go ahead and uh, start paying some bills around here because this insurance thing ain't cutting. So I started saying, you know what? All right, let me, let me pray about this. And if this is what God wants me to do, I'm going to go into law enforcement and the doors will open. And sure enough, that's what I did. I prayed about it and the doors just kind of flew open. So when I got in the door to law enforcement, I started figuring out, okay, cool, you know, this is a decent job, but I still didn't feel like this is what I wanted to do. I felt like every time I did a traffic stop, I felt like I was messing with somebody. Every time I took somebody to jail, I felt like I was messing with somebody. I didn't like that feeling, and that was because my trainer was telling me how I needed to do the job myself, and it was based off of the way he was doing the job, and I didn't like it. So I was like, you know, I don't know if this is for me, God. Like, you know what? Show me something. I know you said that you were going to open the doors. You opened them, but I still don't know if this is what I wanted to do. And so I was actually really successful early on. I graduated at the top of my class. You know, I got some awards, some accolades early on. But it wasn't until I got out of training that I realized this is actually dope job. The reason for a dope job was because I realized that I didn't have to do it the way my trainer told me to do it. I, there's something that's called discretion. And what discretion is, it allows you to make your own decisions on how you want to do the job. So I was like, bet if I can go out there, you know, make decisions the way I want to make the decision, you know, be the impact that I want to see, then let's do it. So the reason I tell you guys that is you guys got to understand that I didn't always like police officers because I had bad experience with officers growing up. I was pulled over a few times. I was harassed. I was told I was suspicious. My uncles and aunts were pulled over for being a armed in a, or a, a fit in the description of an armed robbery suspect. There were so many different reasons why I didn't like police officers growing up. And so when I got into the job and I started realizing that, man, I can be different than those officers that mistreated me, I was like, boom, let's go. Now I'm going to start changing the industry and the way I see things and the way I do it. So I graduated, got through the academy, I got through training. Now I'm a police officer out there doing the job that I wanted, that I least, that I despise the most. And so I said, what can I do to be the change that I want to see? So there's a couple things that I want to do for, with you guys today that is not just going to apply to law enforcement, but it's going to apply to your day-to-day -day uh, day -day life, your day-to-day -day, uh, life as an athlete. There's things that we have to do, each and every one of us, in order to provide the solutions that we need in our life. And so I'm going to go back to the, 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 the ways you guys describe law enforcement because I'm going to use that to make my next point, and then I'm going to give you guys a formula that I've used for my own life in order to have success. Then we're going to connect all that stuff, and by the time we get off this call, not only hopefully will your perception change a little bit about police officers, but I also want to give you guys a directive on how you guys can go out there and better yourselves and then also better our communities because Lord knows we need it now. So I'm going to read down some of the names right now or some of the, the ways you guys describe police officers, and then we're going to go and talk about how I took all those things and say, you know what, I'm going to change the way people view that. So with the first one I see up there is untrustworthy. You know what, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, sometimes in police work, you feel, you feel like officers are untrustworthy. You look at Minneapolis and what happened to George Floyd. That would make me feel untrustworthy because that officer did not belong or did not deserve to be a police officer. He did not. 
what he signed up to do is not what I signed up to do. He took that man's life. He murdered him in cold blood. And that's not what I signed up to do, which is why I felt untrustworthy about the job. Defender, win. I love it. You know what? In my job, I am a defender. There are many nights that I go out every single day where there's a man with a gun call and I have to show up to that house with my gun to make sure I can protect the citizens of that community. And, at the, and while I'm doing that, all in the comforts of my own home, I have three children and a wife that are hoping that I make it home to them at night. But I'm out there because I have to be a defender for somebody else. Just three days ago, I went to a call for service where a guy was threatening to blow up his house. He turned on all the gas lines in his house and he said, I'm going to light a match and I'm going to blow my house up. So I pulled up on the scene looking like Denzel Washington, like, hey, we about to do this. But I was nervous because I'm like, man, shoot, like this dude trying to blow everything up. So what I did was I said, you know what? I signed up to be a defender and I have to defend the rest of the neighborhood from this dude blowing the house up. And thank God God was with me because we were able to bring that to a peaceful resolution. So yes, police officers are defenders in many ways. Some uh, Jackson, you said trustworthy. I appreciate that. Every single day I go to work, I try to be as trustworthy as I can. And that's because I took up an oath to serve you guys as a public. So when I see things, I have to make sure I'm honest in everything that I do, every thought and deed, because I signed up to be trustworthy for you guys. So yes, we're that. The distrust, I already talked about that one. Unsure, my man Ryan said, you're not sure how to believe. Oh, you're not sure what to think. You know what? Right now, our society doesn't know what to think. So we have the media, part of the media says, hey, these police are animals. They're out here murdering cats. They're killers, like somebody said, we're gonna get to that in a minute. But then you have the other half to say, no, nah, we're defenders, we're helpful, we're heroes. And sometimes it's hard to figure out what it is that law enforcement is all about. I want to tell you guys right now that every single police officer you guys deal with is different. And the reason we're different is because we're all human beings. You guys are all athletes right now. If I'm going to bring up a situation or an example, and, I'll, and I'm sure some of you guys will laugh, but I want you guys to think about a player on your team or in your past team that was as trash as ever. Think about that person, put him in your mind, and I want you just to think about that player that was just trash. I see some of y'all laughing because y'all y'all know what I'm talking about right now. All right? So y'all thinking about that person. So now I want you to think about the player that everybody went to when they needed the game-winning shot to be made. So think about that player. All right, cool. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think about the coach that you had that was just garbage. That coach that was trying to tell you what to do but didn't even know what to do himself. That coach that was trying to tell you how to shoot the ball and my man didn't even play basketball himself. So think about that coach. Now I want you to think about the best coach you've had when you played in law or when you played whatever sport it was. So think about the best coach, the coach that knew what he was doing, told you to do it, and if he had to go do it himself, he can do it. All right, so the reason I give you those examples is because the one thing that I want you to realize is, is that every single one of those people, there's no different in law enforcement. We're all individuals. So sometimes you're going to get some officers that are really, really good, and sometimes you're going to get officers that are really, really bad. But I want you to realize is that we don't all make up a majority. I'm different. You guys ain't never going to find a cop that looked this fresh. I'm show, I will show y'all my J's, but we on Zoom right now, so I can't do that. But I'm trying to tell y'all is we all different. So some of the other ones we have, misrepresented. You know what? You're absolutely right. The reason we're misrepresented is because I'm a black man in America, but I'm also a black police officer in America. And I'm actually in the middle, and it's super hard right now. I have lost some of my best friends right now because they don't agree with law enforcement. But at the same time, I work at a department that's full of mostly Caucasian people, and they don't understand what it's like to be a black man in America. So yes, we are misrepresented in many ways. Unethical. I have seen some unethical police officers out there that do not do what they're supposed to do when nobody's looking. So yes, we do have unethical people in our profession, but it doesn't make up a majority of us. And the last one I want to get to is there was one that said we're killers. And unfortunately, in our job, I sign, up to, uh, I sign up to do a job that, unfortunately, there may be a loss of life sometimes. As a matter of fact, in March, I actually pulled the trigger on my own firearm six times to stop a threat. And luckily, the guy didn't die. But in my mind, I made up a decision that I was going to have to stop that threat right away. And the reason I made that decision is because your life, your mom's life, your dad's life, your cousin's life matter more at that time than that person just because that guy showed a propensity for violence. So unfortunately, yes, we have to take life. But there are people like the guy in Minneapolis that is a killer, a cold-blooded killer that needs to be off the streets, that deserves everything he has coming to him, but he does not represent a majority. So the reason I, I bring up those examples, the reason I wanted to know what you guys think about police officers is because I need you guys to know that your feelings were my feelings before I got into this job, big time. Like, the way you felt is the way I was feeling every single day before I got into this job. But woo, praise God. Praise God, because once I got into it, I started seeing a different side of law enforcement. Not only did I see a different side of law enforcement, but I figured out, man, I could be a change agent. And what a change agent is, is a change agent is somebody that goes into an industry and just disrupts it. 
just changes it. You know what I mean? So I remember I, I like to, you know, equate it back to when I played ball, when I walked into UNLV. When I walked into UNLV, you walk in that first day, you walk in with all the swag in the world because you know, hey, I'm about to come in here, we about to turn it all around. And we were trash at UNLV. Well, it's, it's the same thing in law enforcement. When I walked in the doors, I said, I'm about to disrupt this whole thing. There's going to be folks that don't like it. There's going to be folks that love it. And there's going to be folks that don't care. But you know what? I don't care because I'm about to change it all up. But in order to get to where I'm at, in order to get that mindset, there was a few things I had to do. So if you're taking notes, what I need you to do is I want you to take these notes down because this is what's going to help you be a change agent for whatever industry you're in. So first and foremost, in life, every single one of us has a passion. And what a passion is, is anything that you can do without having to be put up to doing it. So if I wake up and my passion is basketball, that means somebody can go out there and tell me basketball and I'm not going to feel like it's a chore because I'm passionate about it. So every single one of us has a passion. And what I need you to do is I need you to figure out what your passion is in life. Is it basketball? Is it football? Is it writing? Is it, is it, spitting, is it spitting lyrics? Whatever it is, find out your passion. The second thing I want you to do is every single one of us has a talent. Identify what that talent is in your life. And what a talent is, is something that just comes naturally to you. You could be a talented in basketball. You could be talented in football. Whatever it is, you got to figure out what it is that comes naturally to you. The other thing that we have to do in life is we got to work. We got to grind, y'all. We, we have to grind. And, and the reason I'm getting so upset when I'm looking at social media, I'm looking at everybody's Instagram account, because everybody can put up a hashtag. Everybody can say hashtag George Floyd. Everybody can say hashtag police reform. Everybody can say hashtag defund police. But they all put up those hashtags. But as soon as they get off their social media account, what do they do? Nothing. We got to get, we got to put the work in. I'm all about changing things, but we can't change things without work. So we need the passion, we need the talent, we need the work. But this other one, this last one I'm gonna give to you guys is one I just came up with the other day. And the reason I came up with it is because I was at a town hall meeting in my local city where all these people came in talking about defund the police. And I'm all about it. The best part about it is all these folks are passionate. They came in with like a lot of passion. I was like, oh shoot, like I need to put y'all, I need to turn it down a little bit. So they came in with all this passion. They got up to the mic and they had to start. It was their opportunity to say, look, this is why we need to defund police. So in my mind, I'm sitting there, especially as I was, I was like, okay, cool. I want to hear why they want to defund police. I'm ready. Go ahead and spit it to me. So they start spitting. And as they spit, I'm thinking like, whatever they say right now is not true. One, two, it don't make sense. And three, it's, it's false. So I start realizing is that is they had passion to do something, but they were uneducated. They were unaware of the facts regarding the situation that they were speaking to. And so what I said, I was like, you know what? Passion is great. But if we don't have that education, passion absent of education is now ignorant. So you got to add that education piece to it because all those four things right there are going to take you to where you need to be. So I'm going to give you examples of what happens if you don't, if you have one but not the other, if you have a few but not the other. And then I want to show you guys what it looks like when you have all four of them. And then we'll break it. We'll, we'll wrap it up and then we'll take a few questions. So if you have a passionate person, a pe person in basketball, but he lacks the talent, what you're going to do is you're going to have somebody that's going to be bouncing that ball around everywhere he goes, but realistically, he's not going to make it to the league. If I'm five foot zero and I'm bouncing that ball around every single day and I'm going through my legs and I can hoop up everybody, but I'm five foot zero, I got to be realistic with myself and say, can I make it to the league? And odds are, I, I can't. So we got to be realistic. I can have all this talent in the world, but if I don't have that passion, it's not going to get me out of bed to go practice. It just ain't. Because you got to have that passion. You got to be willing to do the things that nobody else wants to do. So you got to put that talent and the passion together. And then we talk about the grind. The grind is one of the most important parts because if we don't grind, you can have all the talent in the world. You can have all the passion in the world. But if you don't grind, you're going to be real good at what you do, but it's only going to last for a minute. So that's why you got to put those three together. But then when you add the education piece, woo you will become unstoppable at that point. And so those four things that I just mentioned to you are what I did for my profession. I took those four things that I've had my whole life and applied them to me. I said, what? I said, Ryan, what are you passionate about? And I said, you know what? I'm passionate about changing things. I said, I'm passionate about going into different, whatever it be, schools, cities, whatever it is, I'm passionate about changing things. And you can look at it in my DNA. When I was in middle school, I was a president of the school. I was a president of the little school board, whatever they had it, or a president of ASB. When I went to high school, I was a president of ASB there. I was a quarterback on the football team. I was a star track athlete. I was adamant about changing things. I was passionate about it. So I knew whatever it was, I want to go into whatever industry and change things. So I'm passionate about making change. What am I talented about? 
Well, if you guys go on Google right now and Google what is the number one fear in the world, what you're going to find is public speaking is the number one fear in the world. Above snakes, above spiders, above heights, public speaking is the number one fear in the world. And I realized early on that God is the one that gave me the talent to speak in front of people. So I took my passion to change things. I put it, I combined it with my talent to public speak. And then I threw that grind in there, which is every single day I'm waking up early, whether it's making a phone call, whether it's getting on there, whether it's looking up the news so that way I can get educated on it. And I go out there, I put those three things together, and I was able to create Breaking Bears United, but I was only able to do that with the education that I did every single day to know what I needed to do to change this industry. Those four things have given me an organization that gives me, the, affords me the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Those four things has given me the opportunity to talk to Dak Prescott last week on a Zoom call to figure out how we can change law enforcement. And so what I just described to you, I've just described to you as a black man in America that is a police officer that is changing things from within. So all those little things that you guys said earlier that you said, hey, you know what, man, I feel like y'all killers. I feel like you guys are unethical. All these different things. I'm living proof that we can change that. And it's only because I apply those four things to my life. So now I need you guys to do right now is what I need you to self-reflect and say, where am I at right now? Am I on track with where I want to be or am I going backwards? Am I on track or am I going backwards? I'm 33 years old. And so I've asked myself this question. I said, Ryan, what is a 43-year-old you going to look like? Is that 43-year-old you going to look the same way you do now, just a little bit fatter and a little bit round in the tummy? Or is that 43-year-old you going to be looking in shape? Is that 43-year-old you going to be living in a gated neighborhood? Is that 43-year-old you going to be pushing an Aston Martin that's black on black, matted out? Is that 43-year-old you going to have all the J's that you want? Is that 43-year-old you, is everybody going to know who you are in the industry of law enforcement because you changed it from the inside out? Or am I just going to be the same average Joe that I am today? So I need you guys to take that glimpse. I need you to envision what you want to be in 10 years from now and develop a game plan that's going to get you to where you want to go. Guys, I love you. Seriously. And I want to tell you guys, first and foremost, that you know what? We are living in some tough times right now. Every police officer ain't good. And on behalf of those bad officers, I want to tell you guys that I'm sorry. Seriously, I can't tell you guys that enough because when they do bad, not only is it a, a slap in your face, but it's a slap in my face because I'm dedicated to making this stuff better. So I'm telling you guys right now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, uh, for that officer that killed George Floyd. I'm sorry for every single officer that's been unethical. I'm sorry for every single officer that's been a killer. I'm sorry for every single officer that's done things that they shouldn't have do because they thought they have more power than you. No, they don't. I'm a public servant. I'm here to serve you. And I'm here to serve you because I'm here to serve Jesus Christ first. And so what I want to tell you guys at the end of this is that whatever it is, just realize whatever officer you come across, just know that they are human beings too. Lead with the empathy. Lead with respect. Lead with love. And if they don't give it to you, if that back to you in return, don't worry about it. Because one, you can go and complain to their boss. But two, I believe in karma. What goes around comes around. But if you always control your actions, if you are always making sure that you're leading with empathy, if you're leading with love, if you're leading with respect, you ain't got to worry about anybody else. I promise you. I've been doing that. I've been living by that my whole life. Lead with empathy. Lead with love. Lead with respect. And it's never steered me wrong. And, I, and if somebody's not doing the same thing for me, all I say is, hey, what goes around comes around. So last thing I'm going to leave is, I'm going to leave you guys with this, man. Deion Sanders is one of my favorite players. And the reason I'm able to get up and do what I'm doing, because he had, he had said a quote a long, long time ago, and, he was, and it sticks true for me oh so much to this day. He said, you know what? When you feel good, you look good. When you look good, you play good. When you play good, they pay good. Remember that. Stick to that. Whatever you do, go out there and be the change that you need to be. God bless. Let's take some questions, guys. Thanks again. All right. I'm going to allow you guys to unmute yourselves if you have a question. You can go ahead and speak up. Keem said that's one of his favorite sayings. Nathan, you can unmute yourself and ask that question. Or if you can, do uh, you see that, Ryan? What are some of those solutions that you and Dak discussed? You have to unmute yourself, Ryan. I think you got. Okay, unmute. my bad. Yeah, there it goes. So, um, so Dak was talking about he wants to put up some money, he wants to pledge some money to reform law enforcement. And so, I actually have a lot of the solutions. Dak uh, obviously is not in law enforcement, so he doesn't really know what to do or where to go. 
So me and him are just kind of just uh, talking back and forth to figure out, hey, what, what's the best thing we can do? One of the things that we got to do is we got to change our recruiting practices. I'm telling y'all now, man, like, even though y'all may see law enforcement a certain way, this, coming from a former athlete, this is probably one of the dopest jobs ever, seriously. If you don't go professional anywhere else, if you don't go into business for yourself, this is one of the dopest jobs because it reminds me of being an athlete. Like, I remember when I got hired where I got hired, man, I, they, they, they toured me around the station, they wine and dine me, they gave me all the equipment, they, they pay you good, and then you compete with everybody. So, I, like, I'm adamant. Like, I told you guys that story about the guy that wanted to blow the house up. So I just got recently promoted. So now I'm a field supervisor. And so what I wanted to do is like, shoot, man, when I get on call, I want to be able to run that thing. Like, I want to be the quarterback. I played quarterback in high school. So I'm like, hey, you know, get the fire department out here. We're going to roll around back. We're going to cut the gas. When we come back, we're going to roll up to the front of the house. We're going to start crisis negotiation. And I want to be the one that controls that scene. But that's only because of that competitive drive that I've had from day one. So what, I, what we need to do is I need to be able to convey that to guys like you and gals like you so that way you realize that, hey, if the, if the athletic thing don't work out, man, you can come be one of the freshest police officers out here, make a good living, actually impact lives every single day, but have fun while you do it and make good money to do it too. Coach McKenzie had a great one also. Uh, your challenges, your greatest challenge is being black and wearing blue. Woo! Huh. Right? Uh, so, yes, you're right. I actually just did a uh, – I did a video on my Instagram. If you guys are on Instagram, please follow me. It's uh, breaking underscore barriers underscore united. But um, I did a video yesterday and it's called uh, listen. And I'll try to remember what it says, but it goes, listen, you know, um, I've lived a good life, but even though I've lived a good life, it's come with its challenges. Listen, you know, when I was younger, I dated a girl whose dad, I found out after the fact, told me that she better not bring home any nigger babies. Listen, I dated a girl one time who she couldn't bring me around her family members because I was black. Listen, I've gone to football games before and they wouldn't let me back in when I was a visitor just because they said I look suspicious. Listen, you know, I've gone and been driven a car and, and been pulled over and said I look suspicious and they didn't have any other reason for stopping me. Listen, you know what? As a police officer in America right now, I go out and I come to your home to keep you safe at night so that way you can sleep peacefully. Listen, when I go to a man with a gun call, I have three babies at home with a wife at home. And as I'm driving there thinking about how I'm going to solve the solution, I want to make sure that I can get back to my family at the end of the night. Listen, I've gone on a call before where a guy stabbed his dad with a samurai sword and he came after me and I had to make sure I could protect myself so I can make it home at the end of the night. Listen, the reason we all need to listen, y'all, is because we, there's two sides to every story. And as a black man in America, it's definitely hard because nobody sees both sides of it like we do, but we also get both sides of it. I've been called a nigger. I've been called an Uncle Tom. But you know what? I keep pushing forward because I know as long as I can leave with the empathy, love, and respect, I know I'm going to change the game just the way I want to. Did you see this one from Keem Jackson? How does your family feel about the events and you being a part of the, the blue wall? Well, so my family knows that I'm not a blue wall. I'm not a part of that blue wall. And the reason I'm not a part of that blue wall is because I know they know I'm Ryan Tillman before any badge, any gun. I always tell people, you know, there, you know, I have moral and ethics that come before any badge and any gun. So even though I work in an industry that right now is not looked upon as the brightest light, they know what their dad does every single day. As I was driving to my studio right now, I got my youngest son that's actually sitting right next to me. And I said, son, what do you want to do when you get older? And he said, I want to be a police officer. I said, why? Because he was like, I want to be like dad. So my, my son knows that, hey, look, man, I could be just like my pop, not no blue wall. So yeah, my, my, my wife and them, they're all kind of feel like kind of weird and hesitant right now because there's some crazy times and people don't know how to feel about them. But they also know what their dad represents, what their son represents, what their brother represents. And so does my son. He represents, he knows what his dad represents. And so I don't even look at it as being a part of a blue wall. I look at it as being a part of a solution. And part of that solution is me calling out those bad officers. And I've been doing that for about six or seven years now. And so I want you guys to realize part of being a change agent takes courage. It's going to take you doing things that you may not want to do. It's going to take you speaking out on things that nobody wants to speak out about. But when you do that, I guarantee you, you'll be able to change and disrupt whatever industry you go into. see any other questions please please uh, if you got any other questions uh, crazy experiences whatever it may be where we go we got we got some folks from new york i got some uh houston hey, i'll be in i'll be in dallas next week shout out to dallas so th this is coach mckenzie again i, I got i get my kind of a follow-up question i mean i hear heard what you just said but so i mean you know obviously when you go to work i mean it's, it's like a locker room with those other guys so how do you communicate with, with those rogue officers that are in there 
that you know are of different belief. Uh, I mean, and especially from a standpoint, I mean, sometimes you may be in a situation where you respect, you expect for them to have your back. So uh, I, I guess I'm just curious about about that because I mean I, I'm I'm hearing the message, but you got you, you know I mean yeah I'm in I'm in Minneapolis and we you know I yep. mean our our black policeman has had a lot of issues to the point even our current chief was a part of a lawsuit around discrimination. So how are you messaging that in the locker room? I guess is my question. So you got to call it out. I've been calling it out I, and I've been ridiculed. So it's funny, man. Yesterday we did this. Uh, this huge department debrief, and it was like the chief was there, everybody was there, and um, and at this debrief, we're talking about the current the current situation because you got a lot of people that are like, you know, don't know how to feel. Like you got a lot of, you know, whether it's a black officer, white officer, white officers feel like they're hated by everybody right now. Black officers feel like they in between. So we had this huge department debrief, and as I was sitting there, you got to realize there's over a hundred some odd people there, people that I work with, and so I started telling them about my personal experiences just being a black man in America. But then I also say, you know what, as much as I love, you know, working at the department, I also got to call a spade a spade. And I'm going to keep it 100 with you guys. And this is in front of mine. This is in front of everybody. I said, when I started this organization, I had so many haters. I had so many naysayers that were always either talking behind my back, always trying to, you know, throw shade at my way. Like they, there were folks that were trying to get my stuff stopped because and they were, you know, because they were either hating on it. They were jealous of it or whatever it may be. It could have been prejudice. But I put them out. I called every single one of them out in front of my chief yesterday. And, and it was crazy. You could hear a pin drop in the room. The reason I bring that up is because what I've learned and what I've realized throughout my life is I got to be able to take a stand even when, it's not, even when it's not fun to do. And let me tell you, there have been some times where I'm like, man, I'm nervous. One of those times was taking a knee with some of the protesters that came to a police station the, a lot, the other week. And I prayed about it. I was like, God, what do you want me to do when that time comes if, if, if I am led to take a knee? And I was meditating on it deeply. And I was realizing like, man, if I take a knee, I'm going to be looked at as being different from my peers. But you know what God reminded me is like, are you doing this for your peers? Or are you doing this for me? So when you ask that question, what am I doing in the locker room talk? I shut stuff down. If they talk about anything that's negative, I shut it down. If they're talking about something that's going to compromise me and my job and the safety of our community, then I go and talk to the person that needs me. So I have a great relationship with my chief. I have a great relationship with my captain. I've had personal one-on-one -on -one meetings with them about folks that were doing things that doing something that they shouldn't be doing. As a supervisor now, I call them out. And I've even told them, hey, look, if you ever see me getting out of hand, make sure you call me out too. Just because I'm a supervisor, make sure you pull me back. It's our responsibility. So I know it sounds cliche. I know it sounds easy, but it's not. It's not easy. But the, what I do is that locker room talk, I shut it down, and I let them know where I stand by and why I stand by that. And I don't waver in that, and I can't waver. That's why I didn't waver when I took a knee. That's why I don't waver when I stand up and, and talk about my beliefs, because the moment I waver is the moment that everything I just gave to you guys today is now jeopardized because you're like, hey, he's just like everybody else. Sorry about that. I guess I'm almost out. There you go, buddy. Hey, did I answer your question, Coach? Uh, uh, absolutely, and, and very well. I mean, I, and I just want to say, man, I appreciate this so much. Man, this is good stuff. No, thank you for having me, man. And I, I want to encourage all my athletes on there. Um, and, and honestly, tell me right now, and, and type it in, whatever, but what are, you, what are your guys' true feelings, like, about our current state? Like, wh what are you feeling inside? Like, are you feeling scared to be black? Are you feeling scared of police? Are you feeling like, you know, do you not know what to do if you get stopped by police? Like, ask those questions, because I want to be able to make sure that when you leave this, it, I want you to feel a little bit better and know that change is on the horizon. So please ask those questions right now, because so, so I, someone I would did ask that, Ryan. So tell us what, uh, if, if stopped by an officer, like, how should one respond? What's the proper way you're a police officer? Um, you know, just, just walk us through that. So if, if you're ever stopped by police, the first of, and I, I know this is going to sound cliche and I know some people are not going to like it, but it is imperative that we cooperate. Imperative. And here, and here is why. You know, I have a tendency in my family before I became a police officer, like, you know, and some of you guys probably agree with this or relate to it, but in my, in my family, we like to argue a lot. I was just arguing with my wife this morning, like, we were talking about something dumb and we were just going back and forth because we had to be right. Like, it was the most dumbest thing and like, we just kept going back and forth because we had to be right. But I want you guys to realize is that in our profession, when people argue back with us, there's something that's called deflection. And there have been so many times where I've actually dealt with people that were trying to do something crazy, that were actually armed, 
I, I, I remember one time I pulled a vehicle over for just not having a front license plate on it. And when I pulled everybody out the vehicle, they had a loaded semi-automatic handgun underneath the front seat. And they were actually going to go get revenge because their boy just got killed last week in a, in, a, in a drive-by. So as I'm doing that, I didn't realize, remember, I pulled them over for a stop sign or, or a front, no front license plate. And so what they were trying to do is they were trying to deflect. Hey, sir, is there, some, is there a reason why you're stopping us? I mean, it, can you tell me? I mean, why should I have to do this? Why should I have to do that? But what they were doing is they're trying to deflect because they're trying to take my attention off of what, why they, what's, what they're in trouble for. And so when you start to argue back with the police officer and if an officer doesn't know you, they're going to maybe either one, assume one of two things, either A, he just really don't want to get this ticket or B, he's trying to hide something. So as long as you cooperate with whatever that officer tells you to do, hey, can you keep your hands on the steering wheel? Yes, sir. And you don't have to, if you don't want to, you don't have to have no, you know, great conversation with this officer, but just whatever he asks you to do, just listen to him. Because we as officers, we don't know what we're, we're dealing with. On my Instagram page, probably about uh, eight or nine posts ago, I posted a video that came to us out of Las Vegas where these officers stopped this guy because he had just stole his cell phone. And in this video, you can see the guy sitting in his car like this. He's like, well, why do you got to talk to me? No, I mean, is there a reason that you need my license? And he keeps going back and forth and back and forth. Ultimately, end up, what he ends up doing is he pulls a gun out and he shoots one of the officers twice. One hits the officer and it actually goes through his lung and he hits the other one in his belt. And then he also had another firearm in that, in that glove box. So what he was doing was he was deflecting because he was trying to find that opportune moment to do whatever he was going to do, whether it's fight or, or, or flee. And so the reason it's so imperative for you guys to cooperate is so that way that officer could do whatever he has to do. If you want to know why you're being stopped, you can pull out, hey, is there a certain reason you can tell me why you're being stopped? And if he doesn't give you a right answer, just get through the rest of the stop and then go to your parents or go straight to the police department and complain about it. You know, I have a really good friend of mine. He always told me this. That he's a civil rights activist. He says the time of the stop is not the time to argue. That's what court's for or that's what complaints are for. So don't argue right then and there. The, your most important thing you can do is make sure you get out of that stop safely. And so anytime you are pulled over by police, make sure you just listen to whatever they tell you. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Roll all your windows down. The reason I tell you roll all your windows down is because when I walk up at night, if I can't see who's in the back seat, it makes me a little bit more scared because now I don't, I don't know who's in there. So I've always been taught to roll the windows down, put my hands where I can see them. I'll ask that officer, hey, you need me to drive my, grab my license? Yes. My license in my front pocket? Okay, I'm going to reach for it now and do that. So that way they know your every move and it kind of eliminates all the questions in the air. Uh, Jamie Williams had a good one here. Um, are all officers required to pass a cultural competence test before given a gun and badge? So we do have it. And so the thing about policing is it's different from uh, city to city, county to county, state to state. Uh, I know in the state of California, we have this thing that's called the, the it's called the California Post, which is a police officer standardized training. And so in the academy, we do go through a segment of culturized, uh, culturized training and diversity training, but it's not enough. And if you ask me, we can do more of it. I, I was telling somebody, I was telling my chief, I was like, we need to have the whole department watch the movie Harriet. Because that movie, when I saw the movie Harriet, I was like, man, shoot. Like, th these are things that other people need to know and understand why we're where we come from. And another thing is, too, is like they need to understand the importance of how cultures are different. But the other thing I want to tell you on that is, though, is no matter how much cultural training we do, there are just some things that you can't teach and there's some things you can't learn. We all know, like, for example, in the black culture, you know, and yes, both my parents are black. I hate saying that, but everybody's like, hey, man, are both your, yeah. Both my parents are black. In the black culture, in my family, we talk loud. We talk with our hands a lot. And so because we talk with our hands a lot, you, mo you, might, you might be dealing with a white police officer who grew up in the suburbs who's never dealt with, you know, black folks that much. And so when you talk with your hands, they take it as being threatening. Whereas me, I'm like, I'm not tripping. That's, how, that's what we do. We talk with our hands. So there is a certain level of training that they need to know to understand that. But at the same time, we can't also screen them out of police work just because they didn't, they didn't have the privilege of growing up in a cultural neighborhood. So there's a fine balance. And one of the things that we're lacking in our society right now is balance. And so I'm actually committed to that cause, which is why I started another organization, which is, uh, you know, dedicated towards recruiting some of the best minorities out there. And that way we can have this, the people that look like us patrol our streets. That was good. Ed Harris, uh, great question here. Is the issue a few bad Apple cops or do we see uh, systematic racism in your department or in the police departments around the country because of the Ooh. nature of the structure Great question. of the police system? Great question. So I, I, first and foremost, I'll say, yeah, there's a few bad apples. I, I've worked with a lot of police officers. By having BBU, it's allowed me to travel the country and speak to police officers from all over the, the country. 
And almost every officer that I've come across really has good hearts, whether they're white, black, Mexican, Asian, or whatever. When we talk about systematic racism, this is what we have to realize. And I hate saying this, but it's so true, is law enforcement has become the doormat to everybody else's initiative or agenda. What I mean, law enforcement wasn't founded on good principles, so we know that. We can, we can already say that. But we got to look at the systematic racism that just in, in, in exists in our society. So last March, I had the opportunity to go out to Michigan. And when I was in Michigan, they have this museum called the Jim Crow Museum at the uh, Fair State University. When I was at that museum, I learned a lot. I mean, my dad and my mom always taught me about Black history, but there was a lot more that I learned on this day. And we talk about Jim Crow laws. And one of the things that I learned about and was taught about was the Blackface movement. If you guys have never heard about the Blackface movement, go look it up. The Blackface movement was created by white people that was essentially was portraying Black people to be angry people, you know, comic comedians, whatever it may be. And they input it in the culture. So that way, that's what most people saw. And when they saw that, it started making them, without you even really realizing it subconsciously, you start being afraid of Black people. You start being, you know, thinking Black people were a joke. And so when we start talking about systematic racism, it's ingrained in everything that we have, whether it's from generational wealth to owning things, whether it's to, you know, all, all Black people, unless you're an athlete, an entertainer or something like that, you can't do anything else. We've been ingrained in that with so much. And, the, and one of the sad things is, is even in our own culture, we continue to perpetuate these stereotypes that were created by another culture for us. So when we get on world star hip hop, when we call the people the N word, I did the, I do this presentation about the N word. When you watch that movie, Harriet, and when Harriet gets out of slavery, one of the first things that happens when she gets to Philadelphia, she sits down with this man and she, the dude and the, and the guy asks her, he says, Hey Harriet, so uh, what do you want to be called? And she's, she's confused. She's like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, what do you want to be called? You're no longer property anymore. You are now free from slavery. So what would you like to be called? And she was taken aback. And so then she gave herself the name Harriet Tubman. So what it did for me is it really put things in perspective. And this is coming from somebody that used to use the N-word all the time in college. Like, I use it every other sentence. What it did for me is it made me realize that every single time I use the N-word, I'm turning a dagger in my ancestor's grave because they fought to get rid of that N-word. And so... I go, I, you, I say that to say this is that we've been ingrained through the system of what black people should be, how angry they are, how dangerous they are. And so we have to be able to start changing our own culture from within, just like I'm trying to change law enforcement with this and trying to change that stereotype. So when we, you know, get on there and we're sharing videos from Real Star Hip Hop of other black folks acting crazy, we got to stop doing that because it gives other people an excuse to use it against us and say, look, they're all animals. See, I told you. And so the reason I bring all that up is because I got to say it's not limited to police work. Is there systematic racism in police work? Yes, there is. But you can say that about you can say that about education. You can say that about business. You can say that about anything in society. There's systematic racism all around us. And so we have to be the change that we want to see for ourselves instead of fitting into the stereotype that somebody else created from us that way at that time that we were classified as property. So, you know, I hope I kind of made sense with that. Okay, we have a, another question, a great question. Uh, actually, two people have the same question, but uh, Trent Wentz and Larry McKenzie want to know, should the police have to live in the community that they serve? How? Let me, I'm going to do this. is going to be best. Give me, come here real quick, Gray. Come here. I always use props. So I'm going to use my son as a prop right now. Come here. Hurry up, buddy. All right. So this is my son right here. Say hi. What's up, man? All right. So that's my son. In my job, not everybody likes the police. In my job, sometimes I take some dangerous people to jail. In my job, sometimes I go on some calls. Last week, I went on one where a guy got stabbed nine times. In my job, there are gangs that exist that have some really crazy power in the, in the industry that I work in. So is it okay to live in the city that you work in? Yes, it is. But it depends on the city because there's some cities out here like San Bernardino being one of them, which is one of the worst cities across the, the country that I wouldn't want to live in just because if I live in the city that I'm working, even though I am so committed to being the change that I want to see, I, there's a reality that not everybody's going to like me. And for that reason, if I lived in that city that I worked in, somebody can follow me home and he's going to get that little man that I just showed you right there. Somebody can know exactly where my wife and kids stay at because they, if they have more access to me. Not to say if you wanted to go find where I live right now, yeah, you could, but it might be a little bit harder than is if I lived in the actually city that I patrol. So I love it. I love the concept. I love the idea of it. But we got to realize is that police work, not everybody likes us. It's, it's a reality of it. And there's some 
there are some dangerous, dangerous people out there. I actually had, I have a podcast called the It's Needed Podcast. And I had a guy on my podcast the other day, really good guy. His name is Artie. I love this dude. But when Artie was 16 years old, he got sentenced to life in prison because he murdered somebody. And when I'm having this conversation with him, he's like, man, like, I've done some heinous things. And I actually made it pretty high up the ladder with the Mexican mafia or whatever it was that he was with. And that being said, is like, there's this thing that's called a green light. If you get green lit and police officers get green lit all the time, that means that there's a light out on an officer. So that way that when they see him, it is their obligation to take that person out. So I love the concept, but yet at the same time, at the end of the day, my family's safety is priority. What, uh, another question, a couple of questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on de defunding the police? That's been coming out a lot in the media and people been, uh, you know, shouting that, but what are your thoughts on that? So uh, again, I'm, I'm a guy with examples. So I watched a YouTube video and the YouTube video was of Michigan, University of Michigan. They got this thing for their football players called the car wash. And so what it is is when they, when they get off the field, they go in there, they take off their shoulder pads, the shoulder pad gets washed. They walk through a maze of showers that hits them from all these different angles. And then when they get out of the shower, they walk into this maze of cold water that's supposed to help them recover faster so that way they can get ready for the, for the next practice or game or whatever it is. The reason we have that, the reason they have that, and all you guys can relate to this as athletes, is why do they invest so much money in our athletes? And that's so, that, that's so they can perform optimally when it comes game time. So we start talking about defunding the police. A lot of our funding goes towards training. So when you say we want better trained officers out there on the street, but yet you want to take away the money that's going to train us to get there, then now that's the exact opposite of what we need to do. So I understand a lot of the concepts. They say, hey, you know, we want to take that money and put it elsewhere. And I get that, like homelessness and, you know, a different thing for mental health. And, and a lot of agencies are already doing that. Like my department, we're already doing that. But when you start talking about defunding them, why would you want to defund somebody that may have to show up on your doorstep one day and not be trained to handle the situation the best, the best way possible? And so the reason most of a bulk of our majority of our, of our budgets go to training, and that's because we want to be the most, we want to perform optimally when we show up to your house. Sounds good. What about police reform? Anything on that? Oh yeah, we could definitely reform police. I mean, I tell people all the time, like, shoot, if the moment we think we've arrived, we need to get out because I don't care what it is. I don't care if you, if you think you're the best player on the team, that's when you're about to start being the sorriest player on the team because you got content. So whatever it is in law enforcement, we can definitely get better. And I, I'm all about police reform. I'm all about tearing things down and doing it better. That's why I'm kind of leading from the front with my organization. So, you know, by creating whatever it is, you know, new recruiting platforms, but by whether it's by doing Zoom calls, whether it's just my me looking fresh in the community that I serve. So if somebody sees me as a human, whatever it may be, I'm all about police reform. So I'm all about it. Now, you mentioned you're going to Dallas. Tell us what do your programs look like uh, if you were to come to Houston, New York City or or Minneapolis? So uh, some of the programs I have, I have this one that's called the Initiative Workshop. The Initiative Workshop is where it's a little bit different than this. I actually tell you guys who I am. I show you pictures of my family. Uh, I tell you about, you know, my, my bad experiences with law enforcement. I ask, you know, my audience about their bad experiences. And I tell them about why I got involved. And then uh, we go into the training aspect. So I cover all that stuff. And then what's cool about it is I actually transition and we do police officer scenarios on stage in front of everybody. So I'll make you the police officer. I'm going to play the bad guy. And then it's up to you to make the decision on what you think that officer should do. And then once we do about five or six of those scenarios, we talk about whether or not it was right or whether it was wrong. So that's probably one of the most popular ones I do. And then I do a lot of diversity workshops where I talk about Harriet Tubman and the power of using the N-word, motivational stuff. And then I have after school programs. So if I were to come to you guys, First and foremost, we do the initiative workshop. It's fun. It's interactive. But then we just start to, start to develop this ongoing relationship because ultimately what I want for you guys is that if you guys ever have any questions, concerns about anything about the profession, I want to be the guy that you guys come to. I had somebody today hit me up on Instagram. It was like, hey, I got a question about this. I saw this on Instagram, and I don't know if it's true or not. I want to get your insight as an officer. You guys know I'm going to give it to you unbiased. I call it, I call it spade a spade. So I'll call it bad when it's bad, and I'll call it good when it's good. And so that's the overall goal. So I want you guys to be able to have that relationship with me. So that way, if you ever need me, you guys can come, come right to me. Man, thank you so much, Ryan. Tell us, shout out to your social media and everything that you have so uh, the kids can follow you. Yeah, for sure. So uh, social media account is Breaking Barriers United. So go on there and follow me. Please do. And if you go on there, follow, DM me and say, hey, I was on the Zoom call. So that way I know uh, I'm on there. I'm on TikTok as Officer Tillman. Uh, and then I'm also on... Um, I have a podcast. So one of the coolest things we have going right now is this podcast. This podcast is dope. It's on all the major platforms. So iTunes, Spotify, you name it. It's called It's Needed. 
And uh, we have a lot of these conversations on the podcast. That, uh, that situation I was telling you guys about with the guy that got a life sentence in prison, he was just on our latest episode. So download It's Needed Podcast and uh, listen to it. Tell me what you guys think about it. But that's one of the most phenomenal things we have going right now. So It's Needed Podcast, it, uh, Breaking Bears United on Instagram, and Officer Tillman on TikTok. Those are my three major platforms. Oh, and I'm also on YouTube. So just look up Breaking Bears United on YouTube, and you'll see a lot of my breakdowns that I do because I do this thing called Tillman Takes where – I'm going to break down, I break down police videos and give you factual information. And I kind of let you know whether or not it was justified or unjustified. The latest one in, re, in, re, in regards to uh, Mr. Brooks in Atlanta, I didn't say whether or not it was justified or unjustified, but what I did do is I laid out the facts and I let you make that determination for yourself since it's so early. Man, we really appreciate it. Uh, we'd like everyone listening to please add you want game on your Instagram and Twitter. Also, there'll be a survey um, that we'll send to you guys on this session and we'd love your feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we did have one more question and if you can, we could end with this, but you know, with everything going on in Minneapolis, how can the community in Minneapolis gain trust with the police? Oh man, go, go get to know them. Seriously, seriously, go get to know them. Uh, most police departments, um, I'm adding you guys right now, you won't gain. So most police departments, what they do is they will, um, they have ride-alongs, they have explorer programs, they have a whole bunch of different things that you can do. So my goal for you guys is go down there and get to know them. Ask them, hey, can I take a station tour? Can I go on a ride-along? Can I do an explorer academy or a citizens academy? Those things are cool because what you're gonna do is you're gonna start to realize like, not only is it a pretty cool job, but you're gonna start to meet the people in there. You're like, man, these guys are just like me in many ways. Like, it's crazy. That's one of the things I learned earlier. I was like, man, all a lot of these cats are very similar to me in nature. Some of them are very different than me. But you'll notice that every single one of us is a human. So if you want to know what you can do to, to make your relationship better with your local police depart, department, go down there and visit and I'm sure they're not going to turn you away. I'm positive. If they do, call me up and I'll, I'll hit them up. <laughs> Man, maybe you need to take a trip there and come to Houston and New York and just, you know, make your world tour, make your rounds, man. Hey, I'm in the process of doing it. And whoever said, you know, E.T. is one of, you know, uh, he's one of my, yeah, he does inspire. That's one of my good friends. Now, actually, E.T. is the one that actually set this up for me. So uh, through Joe. So ET has been phenomenal. And, and, and I, what I want you guys to do, I'm gonna leave you guys on this, is whatever it is, find a mentor for your life. And, and, and I, what I've done is I found mentors for every different aspect of my life. So spiritually, I have a spiritual mentor. For, for finance, I have a finance mentor. I don't want somebody that's broke teaching me how to make money because I'm just gonna be broke. So find a, find a finance, find a physical mentor, you know, for your health and wellness. And then find, like for me, I'm a husband. So I have somebody that I can look up to that has been married for 40 years because I don't want my relationship to just, you know, succumb to, to, to the divorce or whatever. So find a mentor in your life and all those aspects of your life. And that's going to help you develop that 10 year plan that I talked about earlier. Man, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, once again, follow all of his social media. He shouted out a lot for you guys. Also follow You Want Game. In two weeks, we'll have another Zoom on financial literacy. But we'd like to thank Ryan Tillman from Breaking Barriers jumping on. I really, really appreciate it. We're going to end the call. Thank you so much. I need, I, 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 need, I, I need to get on that financial literacy one so I stop spending all my money on all these Jordans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe they can give you a sponsorship. I ain't right, though. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. We appreciate Thanks, everyone for jumping on. Thank you, you Ryan. I'll get with you soon, man. All right. Take care. All right, bye.